Hey, welcome back, everyone. Interesting episode today. I was seeing some rumors that they were creating, well, new ways of vaccinating people, uh, one of them being genetically modified foods. And I, you know, I saw some tweets on this that looked like they were just screenshots. I looked into it. Uh, some of the tweets turned out to not be real. But when I looked deeper into some of the research, I found out, yes, they are, in fact, creating programs like this. There are many well underway. And there are programs right now to genetically modify common foods, including tomatoes and you know basic f fruits, vegetables, uh, in ways that do administer vaccines. And there are programs as well, even including tobacco, looking at how to include the COVID-19 vaccines in food. Um, I found this pretty surprising because I haven't really seen any mainstream coverage on it as far as I've seen. I want to detail some of the research I've done on this and... <laughs> It's, uh, it's wild stuff, folks. Um, also, I want to go into some of the Republican tax plans. They're talking about the idea, well, they're floating the idea of a 23% tax to replace income tax. Uh, well, replace all taxes, including uh, even allowing them to abolish the IRS. I'll be going into that. A lot of other stories, so stick around. And folks, that said, thank you for being here. Those of you on YouTube, Rumble, YouTube, uh, Twitter, Facebook, we'll jump over exclusively to Epic TV after about 25 minutes. Be sure to join us there. That said, let's jump into it. I want to start first on the idea of foods to deliver human vaccines. And I'm just going to show you a bunch of medical papers. Uh, we're going to go through a few of them. Uh, the original research I had, I probably had like 25 different reports. I, I whittled them down because they start just repeating themselves, but... Um, I can say this is, there are numerous scientific reports detailing the research on what they call oral vaccines, uh, specifically using genetically modified foods. Let me show you one. This is from PubMed through the NIH. It says, development of oral vaccines for human use. And in this report, it says, in developed and developing countries, oral vaccine formulations that elicit pro uh, protection at mucosal surfaces are attractive vaccine candidates. Research has shown that vaccine delivery using either oral or non-viral vector delivery or heterologous proteins via the oral route is highly effective. In other words, you oral, you eat it, right? Uh, it's, a, it's a vaccine that you eat. Further in its states, recently recombinant plant viruses grown in plants or transgenic plants have been proposed as edible vaccines for human use. In other words, they're genetically modifying plants. Um, some of these include ingre like parts of plants. Some of them include mo you know, modif genetically modifying like tomatoes and stuff like that. And the idea is to alter these plants so that the plants carry vaccinations uh, that you can then consume and Again, it will, it will function as an oral vaccine. And it said food plants offer many advantages as, a, as affordable oral vaccines, especially for use in developing countries. Let me show you another report. This is from Tayer Francis Online. And it says approaches to new vaccines. And they say further in, the use of DNA encoding antig antigens from pathogenic viruses, bacteria, and parasites as vaccines is a new approach that is receiving considerable attention. This and other innovative approaches, including vaccine production in plants, are appraised in this review. So there's, um, I wanted to include this one to show that they're doing other types of experiments alongside this. When we think of vaccinations currently, we're thinking of you know someone putting a shot in your arm. You're thinking of needles and injections. You're not thinking of DNA encoding. You're not thinking of genetically modified plants. You're not thinking of like tomatoes on the store shelf. I wouldn't think of that. But let me show you some more. This is another one from Frontiers in Immunology. It says oral mRNA vaccines against infectious diseases a bacterial perspective. I wanted to include this because I was curious if mRNA vaccines were included in this research, and yes, they are. It says the mRNA vaccines from Pfizer slash BioNTech and Moderna were granted emergency approval in record time in the, recent, in the history of vaccinology and played an instrumental role limiting the pandemic caused by SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19 virus. 
The success of these vaccines result <laughs> success resulted from over three decades of research from many scientists. However, yes, yeah, scientists who actually call into question this, but uh, we won't get into that part. It says, however, the development of oral, orally administratable mRNA vaccine development is surprisingly underexplored. Our group specializing in salmonella-based vaccines explored the possibility of oral mRNA vaccine development. Um, interestingly, some of these do look into, for example, using kind of what you would call like bacteria or you know, things that grow on plants as a way to carry this. They were looking into, for example, salmonella as carriers for vaccines, for example. Um, I want to go into the real meat of it now, uh, including how this ties directly into how they're altering foods for this. And then I want to go into how this applies to COVID-19 directly. Uh, for the, before I get in that, folks, though, first we do have a sponsor today. Today's episode is brought to you by American Hartford Gold. As we've been talking about in other news, inflation is going to continue and likely get worse. I think there's no question on that now. Even Fed Chair Powell is warning us to brace ourselves. Well, there's a way to hedge against inflation. American Heart for Gold makes it easy and simple to diversify your savings and retirement accounts with physical gold and silver. With one short phone call, they can have physical gold and silver delivered right to your door or into your IRA or 401k. American Hartford Gold is one of the highest rated firms in the country with an A-plus rating from the BBB and thousands of satisfied clients. If you call them right now, they'll give you up to $2,500 of free silver and a free safe on qualifying orders. So don't wait. Call them now. That's 877-260-2764. Again, 877-260-2764. Or you can text Joshua to 65532. Again, it's 877-260-2764, or text Joshua to 65532. And big thanks to American Hartford Gold for sponsoring today's episode. Let's go deeper into this. Let me show you now some of the research on actually using foods to administer vaccines. That's the big question, right? Oral vaccines, they're genetically modifying plants, they're studying it. Are they actually talking about using food as a delivery method to vaccinate people, where they're altering the food itself. And if, hey, if you want to eat, you're going to get vaccinated. <laughs> well, yes, they are. Uh, this is PubMed again through the NIH. And it says, foods as production and delivery vehicles for human vaccines. And it says further in, in the last several years, a novel approach for developing improved mucosal uh, subunit vaccines has emerged by exploiting the use, the use of genetically modified plants. It has been demonstrated that plant-derived antigens are functionally similar to conventional vaccines and can induce neutralizing antibodies in mammalian hosts. Further in, it states that food crops, i.e. food that you grow, can play a significant role in promoting human health by serving as vehicles for both production and delivery of vaccines. And the big one here, going directly into COVID-19 and the vaccines for COVID-19. Uh, many people chose not to get vaccinated uh, with COVID, for COVID-19. Many people, or get the shots, whatever you want to call it. Uh, many people are choosing to not get the booster shots. It's reaching a point now where if you want to eat the food on your plate, uh, maybe you're going to have to get that vaccine because it's going to be contained in the food itself. And this is from directly the laboratory, uh, sorry, the National Library of Medicine through the NIH. And this is a report from July of 2022. This is straight from the horse's mouth, in other words. And it says, emerging trends of edible vaccine therapy for combating human diseases, especially COVID-19 pros, cons, and future challenges. Um, it's a very large report, but I'll just go into the meat of it. It says the spike protein, i.e. of COVID-19, can be used to produce a vaccine against COVID-19. Uh, when talking about these spike proteins, they're putting into these plants and so on. They say when the gene of spike protein or subunit of spike-like is inserted into a plant expression vector, the desired plant, such as lettuce, tomato, or cucumber, can be transformed. You getting that? So they can insert this you know, spike protein into plants and 
basically rather than using a vac an, an injected vaccine as a carrier for you know part of the spike protein which remember remember we're talking about covid-19 they're part of the cited problem people are having with the virus is um the problem of you know the spike protein is, is what a lot of people are citing they're saying they can put this into plants and basically elicit the same response as if they had vaccinated you it says the resulting transgenic plants can be eaten raw as salad and immunized for human beings to for hu the human being to combat the novel virus i.e covid19 many groups of scientists are working together on a vaccine to defend humans against the new you know covid19 virus i won't go into all this because it's, it's actually a really long report and yes i did i did read a lot of these last night uh, but further in it states this just to show you some of the actual groups working on this and forgive me if i say say some of this stuff wrong it says medi medi sago a canadian biopharmaceutical company has created a coronavirus vlp and a vlp stands for virus like particles after getting the genetic sequence of SARS-CoV-2 in just 20 days. It took them 20 days to do this. Uh, SARS-CoV-2, again, being COVID-19, uh, the novel coronavirus based off the original SARS virus. It says they employed a technique that involved introducing a genetic sequence encoding the COVID-19 spike protein into agrobacterium, a common soil bacterium that plants eat. In other words, they're putting it into the bacteria within the soil that the plants then consume. Are you getting this? They've, they've found a way to get the COVID-19 spike protein into, into one of the nutrients or bacterium that plants consume when they pull nutrients from the soil, thereby getting into the plant itself. And it says this, they created plants because, again, the plant then you know, adopt some of this, right? The created plants form a VLP, a virus-like particle, that is made up of a plant lipid membrane and the COVID-19 spike protein. It has now become, the spike protein has now become part of the plant. It says, uh, Nicotania bethamiana, a, close, a closely related to tobacco plant, so it's similar to tobacco, but not quite tobacco, is being used by Metasago to create COVID uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus VLPs, again, virus-like particles. And they say COVID-19, the VLPs are identical in size and form to coronaviruses. These are like coronavirus plants is what they're making. And it says, but they lack the RNA slash DNA and so are not infectious. Maybe until you consume them, but who knows. It says, Metasago completed phase one clinical trials satisfactory and is now progressing to phase two clinical trials. Metasago has already developed VLPs containing influenza viruses, uh, hemoglobin, lutein, uh, lutein, demonstrating their safety and efficacy in animal models and human clinical studies. They're already testing this on humans. In other words, I won't go over all this, but further when it states this, Another company doing this, Kentucky, Kentucky Bioprocessing. And it says Kentucky Bioprocessing, on the other hand, is developing its own fast-growing GM, i.e. genetically modified, tobacco, and has openly declared that it is, pre that it is previously undertaking preclinical tests that can produce up to 3 million dosages per week. A tobacco plant that can carry the SARS-CoV-2 vaccinations. Further in it states, the third private sector research group is a collaboration between iBio and the United, in the United States and Beijing CC Farming in China. It's an American company working together with a Chinese company um, specifically on this. And it says in these groups, these companies, they say is, uh, it says, which is coupling COVID-19 VLP, again, virus-like particles, culture with a Lichenese carrier immunosimulatory adjuvant in GM tobacco. In other words, um, they're again looking at how to make tobacco plants, in this case, carriers of this COVID-19 vaccine. 
Um, I wanted to do a segment on this because some of you were bringing to my attention um, links to, I, you know, originally there was a tweet going around. Uh, it was a Bill Gates tweet. And the tweet from allegedly from Bill Gates said that he was saying that they need to get vaccines into foods. Um, I was looking for that tweet. I could not find it. Um, and at this point, I don't believe the, truth, the tweet was real. I don't know if that was meant as basically a psyop, basically trying to claim this entire issue was fake, or if maybe he deleted it or something else. Regardless of the point, I, I think it's kind of losing the forest for the trees, because whether or not Bill Gates talked about it, there are very widespread scientific research programs ongoing as we speak, um, looking, looking to vaccinate people. I, mean, I don't know if willfully or not at this point, uh, but by altering foods. And we've looked at tobacco, tobacco-like substances, tomatoes, lettuce, cucumbers. You know, imagine getting your vaccine salad in the morning. Um, and already some of these some of these programs are already in the human test phase. Remember that there was through Trump's Operation Warp Speed, the release of the vaccines, the COVID-19 vaccines, was sped up, and so programs that were still technically in early clinical trials were made public, and the, the shots we ended up getting, well, some people got, um, were really still early experimental shots. They, they were not in any way, in, in any normal sense, ready for public release and in, in the way that you would normally ever do that. Um, and so I want to make it clear, um, I did not find a direct connection to Bill Gates. I know that was the main accusation people had, uh, but absolutely, there are there are programs very far along looking to basically integrate the COVID-19 vaccines and other vaccines directly into the food supply. Um, I don't know if this would be like wide scale or if you go and get your tomato from your doctor, uh, but they are doing this. Uh, they're doing this on a large scale already. And the reports I showed you are, are a small fraction of the ones I actually pulled up, but basically they just start repeating themselves. You start see, you'd start seeing the basic same information over and over again. Uh, and so I did limit I did cut out the fat, so to speak. And I just limited it to just some of the some of the reports uh, that just stated the same thing. I just cut them down to one instead of five. Uh, but there are tons of reports on this. There are tons of reports detailing this type of research. All right, folks, that said, there's another thing I want to go into today, which is the well, the income tax debate. And I know a lot of people are saying, oh, it'll never happen. Um, the Republicans will never win this battle. I think people are losing, le losing the importance of the narrative debate. Uh, we never thought the Green New Deal would happen. When, when the AOC came out and said she wanted to ban cars and airplanes and get rid of farting cows, and that was actually in the report, when she said she wanted to demolish or retrofit every single building ever made like in America uh, and then build the entire country basically anew, people thought she was out of her mind. Maybe she is. People thought she was out of her mind, and they thought it was the most ridiculous thing ever, and people laughed at her. And here we are now, and almost everything in that Green New Deal report, they're, they're in the process of rolling out in one way or another. So I don't know, maybe joke's on us. Um, that being said, Democrats tend to be good at this. They'll introduce a crazy idea into the public, a very extreme idea sometimes, and people immediately reject it. They'll think that's the terrible idea that will never happen. We never want to do that. You know, go... Go back to the crazy farm or wherever you come from. And typically that's just the way things go. And then what happens? The legacy news outlets continue talking about it. We need to ban gas stoves. Uh, you need to pull that gas stove out of your house. We're not going to force you to do it, uh, but you really, really should. And then before you know it, businesses are creating alternatives. And before you know it, local governments are creating regulation mandating it. And before you know it, all the legacy news outlets, all these big corporate media are just repeatedly stating the same thing, drilling that idea that you thought was absolutely insane deeper and deeper into your brain. And before you know it, you know, one, two years down the road, the thing that you thought would never happen happens, and it happens over and over and over again. 
Uh, the, the Democrats tend to work that way. Um, <laughs> see more butts. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, he said he remembered Bill Clinton. Yes. <sighs> Anyways, um, <clears throat> Republicans tend to not play this game. They they tend to be more cautious, or they just play the role of saying, "Hey, we're not going to do this crazy new newfangled idea you folks are trying to pull out of your hats." But you're finding that is changing now, especially when it comes to the Freedom Caucus. They are actually playing this game now. Republicans are pushing for actually, honestly, kind of extreme, kind of extreme solutions. Um, for example, abolishing the IRS. For example, getting rid of you know completely getting rid of income tax. And whether they're good, I don't. I doubt it's going to happen right away. But the important thing is it's raising in the public psyche and within the realm of public debate the option that it is it is there, and it's making people aware that the IRS is a new agency. We didn't have the IRS in the founding in the founding of the United States. The IRS is a new agency. Income tax was not part of the American tax system. We did not used to have income tax. Uh, this is a new thing. And we've just taken that to be the new normal. Income tax is the new normal. The IRS is the new normal. We never had those things. We don't need those things. And this is the importance of this debate. That's the importance of this issue that probably won't pass immediately, but it's starting a public discussion, just like you and I are having right now, uh, which to me is actually, is actually just as important as the laws that can get passed. If politicians only basically talk about things that they can get done tomorrow, I'll tell you, not a whole lot's going to get done. There needs to be a public debate, a public discussion, and the public needs to recognize a need for a change. That is part of the debate. And the debate, when you're dealing with free societies, is a deep, deep part of how our countries function. Anyways, getting into this now, uh, real quick, Chris Walker on YouTube, you're saying, you won't need a gas stove if you're just going to eat crickets. <laughs> I can see that. <laughs> That's true. You know, you, you get you get your little bag of dried cricket paste. Uh, may, maybe, you know, while you're eating it, you get, you know, maybe you get your vaccine for monkeypox or something like that. Um, yeah, you know, why not? Uh, it does seem that there are some people pushing for that. Actually, crazy stuff in the EU right now. They've now made cricket powder, like a protein powder, a normal additive. And so you could be getting like your pizza or... You know, your potato chips in, well, I don't know if they eat that much in Europe, but I think they do. And you could be eating what you think is a normal food and you're eating bugs uh, because it's just in, it's one of the ingredients. They're already doing that in Europe. Um, but back on the sales tax, let's go into this. Let me show you this. This is the Washington Post on the note of introducing this into the public discussion. Washington Post says this. Democrats hammer GOP plan to impose national sales tax and abolish the IRS. <laughs> They're making it look like the Democrats are, you know, fighting back, fighting back against this crazy GOP plan. Uh, but really, this is this is Washington Post basically engaging in the in the battleground the Republicans have set. Do you understand that? The arena, the public arena, where we debate, where we compete. The public arena where good ideas are brought in and bad ideas are brought in, and we see what is standing in the end. Washington Post, whether it likes it or not, has been dragged into the public arena and is being forced to debate the idea of abolishing the IRS and getting rid of, uh, getting rid of income tax and putting in its place a national sales tax. And they say this. They say the Fair Tax Act, this is further in, sponsored by uh, Representative Earl Buddy Car Carter, and introduced this month would do away with income, payroll, estate, and gift taxes, and instead impose a 23% national sales tax. Like you're, in some places in the U.S., you're already paying like a 17% sales tax. I mean, it's already pretty high in some parts of the U.S. Not to mention Americans are like the only place in the world where people still tip and you're leaving like a 15 to 25 percent tip based on your sales tax anyways uh think think of think of it like this instead of leaving the waiter who's probably getting like 15 an hour these days because of you know minimum wage changes you're getting like 15 to 18 i've seen actually a burger place down the street from here that has an 18 dollar an hour uh, wage instead of leaving your waiter that 
20% tip or you know 15% tip you're leaving the government a 23% tip and by leaving the government that 23% tip you don't have to pay any other taxes on anything and the IRS disappears it just vanishes like like uh, that Marvel movie where Thanos snaps his fingers and they they say they don't feel so good and they just disappear w which one would you take right that this is the debate we're having right now you tell me. I mean, personally, I'd rather, I'd rather pay the, I'd rather give the government that little tip to avoid having to pay anything else. But that's just me. But they say this. Washington Post says it would also eliminate funding for the IRS after fiscal year 2027. A little too late down the timeline, in my opinion. But hey, they're being fair, right? Further, it states on Tuesday, House Speaker Kevin McCarthy appeared to respond to a question about whether he supported the Fair Tax Act by telling reporters simply no. In other words, Kevin McCarthy, the Speaker of the House, a Republican, he does not support that idea. Um, but again, neither did many of the Democrats support the Green New Deal. But further, it states this. Representatives for Carter and McCarthy did not respond to requests for comment Wednesday. An op-ed for The Atlantic this week, anti-tax anti conservative Grover Norquist criticized the reintroduction of the Fair Tax Act as a free gift to Democrats and warned the GOP against allowing a small minority of House Republicans to, to force a vote on it. Norquist also expressed concern that such a national, national sales tax and its accompanying monthly sales tax rebates for U.S. citizens would essentially create a universal basic income. Whatever you think it is, you know, of course, this is the debate. Yeah, MS, uh, M. M. Swilmas, uh, you're saying 23% on food. Yeah, I mean, there would definitely be some downsides on it. Um, also, for people who are maybe like welfare recipients, or I, I don't know, maybe they'd eliminate that sales tax if you're on like food stamps or something. Uh, the point with this is, though, this is not going to happen anytime soon. At least I don't think so. Uh, what, the, what they are introducing right now is a topic for debate. Could America do without income tax? That's the topic of debate that's being introduced. Could America function without the IRS? That is the topic that's being introduced. Although the initial proposal you know, may not actually be something they can use, the initial proposal may not be what is in, in the end implemented. It is raising the public debate over whether there are other options with the American tax system and whether these new things that have been introduced, and keep in mind both income tax and the IRS are new. They are not traditional. They're not things America has always had. They are new. Could we function without them? This is the new battleground, right? This, this topic of debate. And, you know, again, when we approach topics sometimes, you know, I, I personally get kind of split on whether I bring up you know, proposed legislation from random people that's not going to do anything, frankly. It's, you know that it's not going to get passed. It's, it may be, even if it gets past the House Republicans, because you know, they do control the House now, the Democrats and the Senate are going to nix it. They're going to toss it out in the garbage bin right away. And there's no chance on earth, I think, that Biden's going to sign it unless... Unless you get him in the right moment, you know, maybe that maybe they the little bell they have on his neck falls off and he wanders off into his room and there's a paper on his desk and he just just signs his name, you know, just he's just used to it, just writes his name on it. I'm joking. Um, I doubt. I my point is, I don't think Biden's going to sign this. There's no way on earth Biden is going to sign this. Um. <laughs> anyways, <laughs> now. Again, you know, th but I should note again, this is the method used in public debate. This is the method to introduce topics for us to discuss. Um, a lot of times politicians in no way are intending for their bills to get passed. They're merely raising within, within the public sphere debate around things that they see as being important. And once the public starts discussing it, it's only then that the mainstream gets involved. And once the mainstream attention focuses on a topic, if they believe, if it can capture that, only then can it get debated in a serious way and find ways to be implemented. But this is the first step in those things. And again, you know, this is this is a this is the Democrats do it very well. Um, they're very good at this, and they do it very often. Let me show you some other reports here. This is Hakeem Jeffries. And he's taking, 
it's interesting here because he's making a very extreme statement. He's also making false statements. And what's important with this is that people are fact-checking him. You can see there's actually a fact-check on his tweet. Representative Hakeem Jeffries says this, or Hakeem Jeffries says this. He says, extreme MAGA Republicans are trying to impose a 30% sales tax on the American people. We will stop them. Now, after that tweet came out, people were very quick to fact check him. You can see uh, there is a fact check on that. And it notes that it's missing the context that, yeah, Republic, it's first off, it's not 30%. I believe it's 23%, although, although I mentioned the 30% also. Uh, Democrats are saying 30%. They're proposing a 23% sales, a sales tax. Um, it's also noting that he's removing the context that Republicans are not just trying to push a 30% sales tax or 23% sales tax. They're trying to push an elimination of the Fed, of, of the IRS and of income tax, not the Federal Reserve. Maybe maybe one day a man can dream, right? <laughs> and the important part with that is, again, by engaging in the arena, by engaging in the arena of public debate, and especially by engaging it in a way where, in this case, Hakeem Jeffries is making misleading statements, I, I think is a fair way to say it. He's being fact-checked, and people are joining in the debate. This is how things happen in a free society. This type of debate exactly like this. And also remember, there's an alternative. I remember, I just said, you know, Democrats, they do this all the time, and they push things that by any traditional standard are pretty dang extreme and they're doing it like they're they're actually implementing things that most people would think are absolutely crazy and let me show you a couple of these california the uh the model of, of you know sun-baked brains and people who uh, the the model of i think the far left in america basically daily wire has this story they say California bill would create new worldwide wealth tax even for people who flee the state. You can't even escape California taxes. Even if you leave, they still come after you. That's the bill. It says California lawmakers introduced a bill to impose a worldwide wealth tax on wealthy individuals even after they leave the state. The legislation introduced by California Democrat Assembly member Alex Lee would create a 1.5% tax for a resident's worldwide net worth that exceeds $1 billion worldwide, folks. In the 2024 and 2025 tax years, the bill would subsequently create a 1% annual tax for a resident's worldwide net worth that exceeds $50 million with an additional 0.5% tax for worldwide wealth exceeding $1 billion. And the Democrats are saying this. With this modest tax, modest tax, on the ultra-wealthy who pay a lower effective rate than the bottom 99%, we would have sustained investment in our schools, tackle homelessness, maintain and expand needed services, and much more. Um, personally, I haven't seen my taxes being used for almost any of those things effectively. Uh, but aside, maybe they mean um, providing you know free hotel rooms for illegal aliens and uh, giving... Actually, if you identify as trans in San Francisco now, you can, you can get actually universal basic income. Um, I would actually question in San Francisco because they want to give universal basic income to people who are trans. Does that only work for, you know, for example, women who turn into men or men who turn to women? Or does it actually work as well for women who've always been women? Like, how do you define it at that point if there's no such thing as gender? Uh, regardless of the point, California is pushing for these types of laws. I'll show you one more on this. Yeah, um, Autumn, 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 sorry, Aunt Tom, you're saying CA, California, is already taxing businesses that really relocate to Texas. Yeah, they're already doing this to some extent. That's true. You can't escape. You, you can, it's Hotel California. Yeah, you can, you can never leave. That's the idea. Let me show you one more. Just California again, San Diego, my, my hometown. Fox News, San Diego wants to tax people out of their cars and into public transportation. It says San Diego County's regional transportation and agency's latest transportation plan is designed to make driving so expensive that you succumb to public transportation. Oh, the humanity. I, I, I ride public transportation, by the way. 
Um, in addition to the current gas, I'm in, I'm in New York. It's, it's easy to do here, but they say this. In addition to the current gas tax and registration fees, Sandag's plan, Sandag pl plan adds three new half cent sales tax increases over 800 miles of San Diego County freeway lines converted to toll lanes and a mileage tax for every mile driven to pay for their $165 billion public mass transit plan. Point is, folks, look, the left, this is how they operate. They, they push crazy bills. They do stuff all the time that most of the country would never accept. And by doing it step by step and constantly and drilling it into people's heads and repeating it constantly in the media, the things they push end up oftentimes happening. It ends up it ends up happening half the time. Um, and Republicans don't play that game usually. You are now seeing them begin to play that game. And again, the debate on the necessity of the IRS, the necessity of, uh, again, you know, federal, uh, federal taxes, income taxes. Uh, this is now becoming the area of debate. All right, folks, that's, let's go deeper into some of the stuff. Uh, for that, though, let's jump over to Epic TV. I mentioned before that there's a company tr working on solar geoengineering, and they want to release they want to release substances into the atmosphere, into the, into the sky. I, I, I know there's other programs for the stratosphere, but I think this one's lower down. And Mexico is banning it, um, <laughs> which is bizarre because we talk about, like, we talk about, like, chemtrails and stuff like that mexico just banned chemtrails um, let's let's talk about this on epic tv uh folks again we do have our uncensored video platform we can talk about a lot of things i cannot talk about on youtube they give me strikes every now and then i i'm amazed we're still there i hope we don't lose it uh so come join us on epic tv breathe the air of freedom with us that's and there's also great conversations there actually i keep the chat up on my my screen and i do watch it Come join us in Epic TV, folks. Before we jump over, let me show you a trailer. I recently spoke with Richard Jaffe about doctors being silenced by state medical boards, and they just won this case. Let me show you a trailer for that, then we'll jump over to Epic TV. This is the first effort to suppress healthcare practitioners from telling patients what the doctors think. In July 2021, the Federation of State Medical Boards issued a press release. And what they said is doctors who knock the vaccine and promote off-label COVID drugs like ivermectin or HCQ should have their licenses revoked or disciplined. What happened as a result of that, in California, what they did is they introduced a bill that basically said if you spread what they call COVID misinformation, a doctor can be discipline. The point of the bill was to stop doctors from speaking out in public because they said it stopped uh, herd immunity. And if they get away with this, it's not going to be the last time they do this for the next pandemic. All right, folks. And again, that's exclusively on Epic TV. And that being said, come join us now on Epic TV because I'm going to do the rest of the episode there. Again, I do an hour and a half show, so come join us. Um, we're going to talk about chemtrails. I never thought I'd see the day, but Mexico just banned them. Um, here we are. Here we are, folks. 2023. <laughs> now, come join me on Epic TV. We'll talk about it, and I'll see you there. And folks, thank you for being here.